Welcome back. Here's The Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 1, Part 1, On the Arizona Hills. I am a very old man. How old, I do not know. Possibly I am a hundred, possibly more. But I cannot tell this because I have never aged as other men, nor do I remember any childhood. So far as I can recollect, I have always been a man, a man of about thirty. I appear today as I did forty years and more ago, and yet I feel that I cannot go on living forever, that some day I shall die the real death, from which there is no resurrection. I do not know why I should fear death, I who have died twice and am still alive, but yet I have the same horror of it as you who have never died, and it is because of this terror of death, I believe, that I am so convinced of my mortality. And because of this conviction, I have determined to write down the story of the interesting periods of my life and of my death. I cannot explain the phenomena. I can only set down here in the words of an ordinary soldier of fortune a chronicle of the strange events that befell me during the ten years that my dead body lay undiscovered in an Arizona cave. I have never told this story, nor shall mortal man see this manuscript until after I have passed over for eternity. I know that the average human mind will not believe what it cannot grasp, and so I do not purpose being pilloried by the public, the pulpit, and the press, and held up as a colossal liar, when I am but telling the simple truths which some day science will substantiate, possibly the suggestions which I gained upon Mars, and the knowledge which I can set down in this chronicle, will aid in an earlier understanding of the mysteries of our sister planet, mysteries to you, but no longer mysteries to me. So, John Carter, as far as he can remember, has no recollection of ever being a child and has always been a man of about 30, and he does not age. So, um, he has apparently died twice, but is still alive, and yet he still fears death, so that makes him think that he must still be mortal. He uh, is writing down these events that happened to him while his dead body was in an Arizona cave and he was apparently transferred to Mars. So uh, he does not want to be held up as a liar, but hopes that someday science will substantiate the truths that he is telling. My name is John Carter. I am better known. Hi, Cat. Gotta give Cat his due. Hey. My name is John Carter. I am better known as Captain Jack Carter of Virginia. At the close of the Civil War, I found myself possessed of several hundred thousand dollars, Confederate, and a captain's commission in the cavalry arm of an army which no longer existed, the servant of a state which had vanished with the hopes of the South. Masterless, penniless, and with my only means of livelihood, fighting, gone, I determined to work my way to the Southwest and attempt to retrieve my fallen fortunes in a search for gold. I spent nearly a year prospecting in company with another Confederate officer, Captain James K. Powell of Richmond. We were extremely fortunate, for late in the winter of 1865, after many hardships and privations, we located the most remarkable gold-bearing quartz vein that our wildest dreams had ever pictured. Powell, who was a mining engineer by education, stated that we had uncovered over a million dollars worth of ore in a trifle over three months. As our equipment was crude in the extreme, we decided that one of us must return to civilization, purchase the necessary machinery, and return with a sufficient force of men to properly work the mine. So, uh, after the Civil War, John Carter, who had been a Confederate officer, was left without money and without a job, and he joined forces with another Confederate officer, James Powell, and they went to Arizona to prospect for gold. They found a magnificent load of about a million dollars worth of ore, but they didn't have the right equipment to man it, so uh, James Powell uh, was they er, he he and John Carter decided that Powell would go to get the machinery and men necessary to work the mine. As Powell was familiar with the country, as well as with the mechanical requirements of mining, we determined that it would be best for him to make the trip. It was agreed that I was to hold down our claim against the remote possibility of its being jumped by some wandering prospector. On March 3, 1866, 
Powell and I pra packed his provisions on two of our burrows, and bidding me goodbye, he mounted his horse and started down the mountainside toward the valley, across which led the first stage of his journey. The morning of Powell's departure was, like nearly all Arizona mornings, clear and beautiful. I could see him and his little pack animals picking their way down the mountainside toward the valley, and all during the morning I would catch occasional glimpses of them as they topped a hogback or came out upon a level plateau. My last sight of Powell was about three in the afternoon as he entered the shadows of the range on the opposite side of the valley. Some half hour later I happened to glance casually across the valley and was much surprised to note three little dots in about the same place I had last seen my friend and his two pack animals. I am not given to needless worrying, but the more I tried to convince myself that all was well with Powell, and that the dots I had seen on his trail were antelope or wild horses, the less I was able to assure myself. So, John Carter's watching Powell as he heads down with his two pack animals and his horse uh, across the plateau, through the valley, and John Carter can see him, but later on in the afternoon, he notices three small dots seem to be following Powell. So he tries to assure himself that everything's okay, but he, he is not quite assured of it. Since we had entered the territory, we had not seen a hostile Indian, and we had, therefore, become careless in the extreme, and were wont to ridicule the stories we had heard of the great numbers of these vicious marauders that were supposed to haunt the trails, taking their toll in lives and torture of every white party which fell into their merciless clutches. Powell, I knew, was well armed, and, further, an experienced Indian fighter. But I, too, had lived and fought for years among the Sioux in the north, and I knew that his chances were small against a party of cunning trailing Apaches. Finally, I could endure the suspense no longer, and, arming myself with my two Colt revolvers and a carbine, I strapped two belts of cartridges about me, and catching my saddle horse, started down the trail taken by Powell in the morning. So, they haven't seen any Indians in the area, but they had heard reports of them, and John Carter is concerned about who might be hunting his friend, so he gets his guns, oh, excuse me, a little in the weather, uh, so he gets his guns, he hops his horse, and he sets out down the trail to go see if Powell needs help. As soon as I reached comparatively level ground, I urged my mount into a canter and continued this where the going permitted until close upon dusk, I discovered the point where other tracks joined those of Powell. They were the tracks of unshod ponies, three of them, and the ponies had been galloping. I followed rapidly until darkness shutting down, I was forced to await the rising of the moon and given an opportunity to speculate on the question of the wisdom of my chase. Possibly I had conjured up impossible dangers, like some nervous old housewife, and when I should catch up with Powell would get a good laugh for my pains. However, I am not prone to sensitiveness, and the following of a sense of duty, wherever it may lead, has always been a kind of fetish with me throughout my life, which may account for the honors bestowed upon me by three republics, and the decorations and friendships of an old and powerful emperor and several lesser kings in whose service my sword has been read many a time. So John Carter canters his horse at its fastest pace chasing after him but with the falling of darkness has to wait for the moon to rise in order to find the trail and travel safely on. He's concerned that this might all be for nothing and that Powell will get a good laugh at him out of him chasing after but uh, he has not ever been prone to being hypersensitive and has been decorated by many kings and emperors in his time for his sense of duty. So, about nine o'clock, the moon was sufficiently bright for me to proceed on my way, and I had no difficulty in following the trail at a fast walk, and in some places at a brisk trot, until, about midnight, I reached the water hole where Powell had expected to camp. I came upon the spot unexpectedly, finding it entirely deserted, with no signs of having been recently occupied as a camp. I was interested to note that the tracks of the pursuing horsemen, for such I was now convinced they must be, continued after Powell with only a brief stop at the hole for water, and always at the same rate of speed as his. So John Carter, 
Carter comes upon the watering hole where Powell was expected to camp and finds no evidence of a camp and evidence that the ponies that had been following Powell continued after him at the same rate of speed. I was positive now that the trailers were Apaches and that they wished to capture Powell alive for the fiendish pleasure of the torture. So I urged my horse onward at a most dangerous pace, hoping against hope that I would catch up with the red rascals before they attacked him. Further speculation was suddenly cut short by the faint report of two shots far ahead of me. I knew that Powell would, mean, would need me now if ever, and I instantly urged my horse to his topmost speed up the narrow and difficult mountain trail. I had forged ahead for perhaps a mile or more without hearing further sounds, when the trail suddenly debouched onto a small open plateau near the summit of the pass. I had passed through a narrow overhanging gorge just before entering suddenly upon this tableland, and the sight which met my eyes filled me with consternation and dismay. So John Carter speeds after them, convinced that these are indeed Apaches who have captured Powell for the purpose of torture, and he comes out on a small open plateau and finds a sight that fills him with dismay. And that's it for now, so until next time.